my way And when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. Hoping for us is what a Savior. Thank you. 
Heavenly Father, we come to you today. Thanking you for the opportunity to meet together, to meet with you around your table. Father, we just ask a blessing on those that are leading worship, those that are preaching the word. Father, we just thank you for Jesus and we pray this thing in his name. Amen. Enjoy our Christian walk as expressed in this song. While there are shadows, they can never conceal our Savior's love. And while there be seasons of night, his glory floods our soul in heavenly sunlight. <laughs>
loved me, dying to be saved me, buried and carried my sins far away, rising to justify, freely forever. One day he's coming, O glorious day, so we learn these things to come on Lord's day.
word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So the main thing to remember about this is he was there from the beginning. He was also here today. He'll be there in the future. He's the light
Just a few eight minutes on that. <laughs> I thought everybody would have to say that to you. So. Let's go to the Lord prayer this morning. <laughs> Father God, we come to you this morning, and Father, as we acknowledge you as the creator of all things, Father, we want to thank you for all of the good things that you designed and purposed for us to enjoy. Father, we're thankful that it, it has been your desire for us to enjoy these good things. And Father, as you have told us in your scriptures repeatedly, that one of the things that we have from you that is good that we can choose to enjoy no matter what circumstances in life that we find is the food and the drink that you provide. So Father, help us because we live in the midst of an evil people and an evil nation, Lord, that Father, they're constantly lying to us and trying to deceive us about what is important and what is valuable. Help us, Father, to have the good sense to enjoy the good gifts that you have given us. And Father, that would include ice cream as well. So, Father, we thank you for your continued care over us. And Father, help us in our struggles between what the world says is valuable and what you say is valuable. Help us, Father, not to live our lives in such a way as not to take the time to enjoy today. Father, help us to see those things that we can chase that are fleeting and mean nothing. 
Help us, Father, to pursue what is meaningful, what is lasting, what is eternal. So, Father, we're here today to hear you. Father, we acknowledge that you speak through your creation and you speak through your word. Father, we're thankful that you continue to speak in both ways. But we understand, Father, that without your scriptures, without your revealed word, we would have no knowledge of our sin. We would have no knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we would have no knowledge of the work that he has done to save us from our sin. And Father, we would have no way of knowing what pleases you and what displeases you, what would separate us from you and what keeps us with you. So Father, help us to always approach your word honestly with an open mind to hear what you have to say. And now, Father, as we approach your word, we ask, Lord, that you'll forgive us of our sins. Because we do confess, Lord, that is our greatest problem. And we ask, Lord, that you'll forgive us in the exact same way as we choose to forgive those who sin against us. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you ready to study the scriptures this morning? Amen. To the law of testimony, then, we're in Philippians chapter 3. Our text for today is going to concentrate on verses 15 and 16. So let's pick it up in verse number 12 of Philippians chapter 3. This is Paul speaking here. Not that I have already reached the goal or am already fully mature. So Paul said, he himself is not fully sure. But I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. And now here's our text for today. Therefore, all who are mature. So Paul says he's not fully mature. But now Paul is going to consider himself as part of those who are mature. Therefore, all who are mature should think this way. And if you think differently about anything, God will reveal this also to you. In any case, we should live up to whatever truth we have attained. Over the years, there's been a lot of misunderstanding of these two verses. These verses have been used to suggest many different beliefs, many different ways of operating within Christianity, and most are simply misinterpretations of what Paul is talking about here today. So let's see what we can do today about gaining a proper understanding of exactly what Paul is talking about here in these two verses. So we know that Paul has set Christ before the authentic disciples of Philippi as the goal for spiritual maturity. He has told them that he has not reached that goal and is still giving it his full time and attention. We must admit that verses 15 and 16 are difficult to translate from the original language. 
Thus, we have a wide array of translations in our English Bibles. If you would look at several different English translations of your Bible, you will see that verses 15 and 16 are often translated in many different ways, and much of that is due to the fact of how Paul worded what he worded in verses 15 and 16, and that is part of the problem. There are times when I am in my study that I wish that Paul would come and sit down and have a conversation with me so that I could ask him, Paul, help me here. What exactly were you trying to get across? Now, he's, he's never answered the call yet. I know that he won't. So I understand the difficulty of communicating concepts and ideas. I have that same problem myself. When I share something with you, I know exactly what I'm thinking. I know exactly what I'm talking about. But I always don't do a good job of communicating it in such a way so as you understand what I'm trying to get across. So one of the things that's important that we do, and we're fortunate when it comes to Paul, when we come to a situation like this, where Paul's language is a little difficult to wrestle with, fortunately we have a large body of evidence on which to look at to see perhaps what Paul is trying to get across. One of the things that we must understand is that Paul is going to be consistent in his teaching. Paul is not going to contradict himself. We also have to understand that Paul was writing to a specific congregation here who had been specifically taught by Paul, and you and I were not present during those times of teaching. So, what we must do then is look at everything else that Paul has said and use that in moments like this when we're trying to properly translate and then interpret what any author has said in the scriptures. So this morning I have given you there in your outline my translation. My translation of these two verses. And this translation is based upon my study of, of these particular verses, my study of Paul, and trying to put it in such a way that we can perhaps understand it. So here's how I've chosen to translate verses 15 and 16. Therefore, those who are spiritually mature, and when Paul's talking about maturity here, he's talking about spiritual maturity. Paul says, let us be like-minded. So for all of those people that Paul would consider spiritually mature, he says, we are like-minded, and let us continue to be like-minded. And then for those who are not mature, Paul said, and if you think otherwise, who is he talking to? He's talking to those who are not like-minded then God will enlighten you, or I would suggest the proper translation here would be to correct you. Because when God enlightens those who are not like-minded, what is he doing? He is correcting them. So we have two categories of people here. We have those who are mature, who are like-minded and those who are spiritually immature and part of the reason why they're spiritually immature is because they're not like-minded with Paul. And then he says in that third sentence, nevertheless, let us keep in line with what we have attained. And many of your translations will insert a word like rule or teaching or law. Now that word is not in the original Greek. 
but it's understood. It's understood. So what Paul is saying is that there's a category of people who are spiritually mature. And one of the clear indications of being spiritually mature is being like-minded with the Word of God. And then there's a category of people who are spiritually immature. And one of the clear indications of their lack of spiritual maturity is they are not in agreement with the Word of God. And Paul says, if, and we'll talk about this here in just a little bit, if a person who is not like will humble themselves and submit to the word of God, then God will indeed correct them. And then Paul, in summarizing these two things, he said, nevertheless, wherever you're at, stay on the right path. Stay on the right path. Because the goal is still the same, isn't it? The end result is still the same, to become fully mature, to become complete, to become perfect at our glorification. So here's what Paul is trying to communicate to us today. Paul is telling us that in this life, we will never reach perfection, but that is no excuse for not trying. Paul says that he understands that as long as he lives in this life, he is under a curse. He has a sin problem. So he knows he'll never become perfect. He'll never become complete. Because as long as we live in this realm, we'll always be in a state of lack. But Paul says the goal is still to do the best that I can, to do the best that you and I can do, to be like Christ. And what Paul is saying is, is that even though we know that we will never be like Christ in this realm, there's never excuse for not trying to be like Christ. So, Here's our spiritual life principle for today. A spiritually mature person will have the knowledge and wisdom to know that the battle is not over. Last week we talked about three different ways in which a person could lose their salvation. And all three of those ways continue to occur to this very hour. And over the years, get closer and closer now to 40 years in ministry. So I speak from experience. What I have seen more than anything within at least the churches of the Restoration Movement is the problem of spiritual starvation. And it's spiritual starvation based upon the faulty assumption that because I have been immersed in water according to the scriptures, my salvation is secure and as long as I manage to get to church at least every few weeks and take the Lord's Supper, then I'm good. I'll tell you this. This is a memorial feast, but your sins are not forgiven because you come here on Sunday morning. Until the day you die. Or until 
Christ come. It never ceases. There's never a ceasefire. There's never a day off. Because Satan is relentless against you and against me. So, here's what I have witnessed over these years of my life. I have seen people who have gone through the motions for most of their entire life. They were in church on Sunday morning. They took the Lord's Supper. But other than that, there was no transformation in their life. There was no evidence of fruit production. There was no evidence of spiritual growth and maturity. But they were certain that their salvation was secure because they had been immersed in water. And when they found the time to come on Sunday morning, they had the Lord's Supper. You cannot live spiritually without those things. But there is more to spiritual life than immersion and the Lord's Supper. You and I are called to grow up. And one of the saddest things for a preacher to witness someone who never leaves that stage of spiritual infancy. Knowing what's going on. So let's talk about spiritual maturity. Let's talk about what Paul is, is encouraging you and me to today. Number one in your outline. Like-mindedness produces spiritual Maturity. A spiritually a spirit letter a spiritual maturity is not a matter of age, but a matter of well trained attitudes and actions. Here we are again, attitudes and actions. Well, what must we do to our attitudes and actions? We must ensure that they are well trained. And that takes work. It takes daily work. And Paul has a lot to say. The New Testament has a lot to say. Well, the Old Testament does too. But I want us to look at some passages here this morning to help us understand what this spiritual maturity looks like. And I've given you several passages in your outline this morning, and we'll look at a few of them, but not all of them. But I want to begin this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You see, there's always two kinds of people. There's always these classifications that we find in Scripture. And a person will always fall within one or the other. There, 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 there's never a third option or a fourth option. There's never a gray area when it comes to God. So here we're going to talk about those who are spiritual and those who are unspiritual. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Of course, we know Paul wrote this to the church at Corinth. That was a congregation full of prophets. Okay, so that's, in fact, most of the congregations that received the letter in the New Testament were congregations that were out of prophets. Right? So, is it fair to assume then that many congregations will have spiritual struggles and problems? Absolutely. Is it fair to reason then that the problems that these congregations have could could be or possibly could be a problem here in the pie. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's always in our best interest to listen to what God says to churches and sit in self judgment and see if this is a problem that we have that needs to be addressed. So let's do that this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Brothers, brother who Paul talking to here? The church, he's talking to you and me. Brothers and sisters, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people. But if they were Christian, did they have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> Absolutely. That's a promise. That's a guarantee. So Paul is not talking about people who are in the Spirit versus those who don't have it. Spirit. He's not talking about those who are redeemed and those who are not redeemed. He's talking about a classification within that congregation. There are people that Paul classifies as spiritual people, and there are people that Paul classifies as of the flesh. Of the flesh, and then he calls them as babes in Christ. So Paul was making a distinction about the spiritual level of these Christians. He said there are some in Corinth who are spiritual because they are spiritually mature, because they are like-minded. And then Paul says there are a classification within the congregation in Corinth that he considers spiritual babies. And they are spiritual babies because they are not like-minded. And he goes on to explain this in verse number two. I gave you milk to drink. Now, milk is always good to drink. But we cannot live just by milk. He says, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food. Because you were not yet ready for it. So there were things that these Christians needed to understand, needed to put to practice in their life, but they weren't ready for it because they were still spiritually immature. And then Paul goes on to lament, in fact, you are still not ready because you are still fleshly. So here we see this was a choice. There were some within the congregation at Corinth who wanted all the benefits that Christ had to offer, but they still wanted to live their life according to the world. They still valued the thinking of the world, the opinions of the world, and the things that matter to the world more than they valued what God thought. And in their daily attitudes and actions, that was obvious. It was obvious because of the choices they were making. They were not in agreement with the teaching of the scripture. They were not in agreement to what God has called his church to be and to do, but yet they still wanted to be considered as part of the church. Listen to what Paul is saying. He goes on in verse 3. For since there is envy and strife among you, and that was what's going on in Philippi. Paul had to address that same issue in Philippi. We'll see that in chapter 4 when we get there. The Lord permits. And here's why there was envy and strife. There was envy and strife because they were all not like minded. You had the spiritually immature not listening and following the spiritually mature. The spiritually unmature. Infants, the babies, 
thought they already had it figured out. But they didn't. He goes, are you not fleshly and living like unbelievers? And what were they fighting about? For whenever someone says, I'm with Paul, and another, I'm with Apollos, are you not unspiritual people? Now, we've talked about what biblical preaching is. And as long as a man is preaching biblically, it doesn't matter how he does it. Here's what I mean by that. Every man is gifted differently. Some may not be quite as dramatic. Some may be more inclined to be more like a lecturer. And some are just buffoons. When a man is preaching the word of God and it is truthful and it is sincere and it's done with respect and dignity you need to hear that man. You need to hear that man because he's speaking the word of God to you. And that was the problem that was going on here. Now Paulus was showing He was a show. He liked to put on a big show. He was trained in classical rhetoric. That's what rhetoric, classical rhetoric was. It was all about entertaining your audience in order to persuade them to your point. Okay, so Paulus would have made a perfect politician in 21st century America. And as we have studied these particular scriptures, Paul points out that Paul's Failures as a preacher. Paulus had all the gifts, but he was using the gifts improperly. And it was causing division in that congregation because some of the congregation, I like the way Paulus preaches. I'll, I'll show up when Paulus preaches. But when that Paul's in town, he's, he doesn't have it. Well, Paul had it, he just didn't use it. Paul didn't use it because he understood it was not his responsibility to persuade the people. It was the role of the Holy Spirit to persuade the people. And Paul did all that he could to stay out of the way so the Spirit could work. Sometimes people are classified as spiritual and unspiritual based on something like an opinion that doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Go to chapter 14. Another problem that Paul had to deal with that we're still dealing with today. Speaking in tongues. Of course, when Paul dealt with this, they were still valid. But they were out of control even within that environment. What we see today are not biblical tongues. That's the work of demons. And they're still out of control. So this is the context in which Paul is speaking here in 1 Corinthians 14. Let's start with verse 18. He says, I thank God that I speak in other languages. And thankfully, the Homer translates that word glossolalia appropriately. It's another language. It was a known human language, not the Babel that you hear today. 
more than all of you, yet in the church I would rather speak five words with my understanding. His understanding is based upon his knowledge of the scriptures, the knowledge of Christ, the knowledge of the message of Christ, and what he has worked out in order to teach others also. Then 10,000 words in another language. Because what was happening in Corinth is people were using their gifts of tongues to draw attraction to themselves. And that's still going on today. Tongues were never meant to bring praise and glory to the person speaking in them. Now listen to what Paul says to those who are struggling with a proper understanding of speaking in tongues. Verse 20, brothers, don't be childish in your thinking, but be infants in regard to evil and adult in your thinking. So what Paul once again is contrasting those who are like-minded, those who are in agreement with Paul and his teaching, and by extension into our day and time, those of us who are like-minded in perfect agreement with the scriptures. Paul classifies those people as spiritually mature. And then there's the other category of all those who are not like-minded. Paul says, you are spiritual infants. You are spiritual infants because you are not like mine. You following me? This is a little bit more serious than we thought it was. Paul gives us Christ's structure of the church, how the church is to operate, and what the church is to do. Start with verse 11. And he, that is Christ, personally gave some, not all, to be apostles, from our studies in the scriptures, we know that that function is no longer necessary. It does not exist. So if someone today calls themselves an apostle, then you automatically know that they are a false teacher. They are wrong, and you should not listen to them in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Some prophets, once again, on the basis of our study of the scripture, we know that that function no longer exists because it's no longer necessary. And therefore, someone today who declares himself to be a prophet, be aware, he's a false prophet. There's a, there's a false prophet running around Mario County right now. There's a man in Mario County who has said that God has come and spoken What God has told this individual to do is to hold a healing service here in Morrow County in August. And that God's going to heal all kind of people in this healing service. Now that's sad in and of itself. What's even sadder is the number of congregations in Morrow County who are supporting this. 
advertising, praying with this woman. All so Satan can deceive Morrow County, you the Lord has already deceived. Now here's the worst part of this. When those people gather, they've opened the door for demonic activity in Morrow County. Because what they're asking for is not from God. And if these people continue to do this, and we don't do something about it and pray against them, you're going to see a lot more demonic activity taking place here in Morrow County simply because of the work of this false prophet. Because you see, here's what's happening. They're, they're praying. They're praying to their God. And their God is going to answer them. And he and his demons are going to invade Morrow County. If we don't pray to the one true God and ask him to protect this county. They're going around township by township by township. Praying for the movement of God here in the township in Morrow County. You need to be aware of what's going on. These people are dangerous. These people are inviting Satan and his demons into your community and to mine. So, And some are evangelists. Is that function still necessary in the church today? Yes. So that function is still to be a part of the congregation. And the primary function of the evangelist is to study, teach, and preach the scriptures. And then he gave some to be shepherds and teachers. We all know about that dirty word pastor, don't we? Alright. It's not a biblical term at all. The word that Paul uses there should be translated as shepherd. Now, why has Christ put evangelists and elders and teachers into his church? You reckon Paul will tell us? I think he will. Verse 12. For the training of the saints in the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into a mature man or woman with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. You mean to tell me, preacher, that the church doesn't exist for me to have fun? Preacher, is the church responsible to make my time on Sunday morning as convenient and enjoyable as possible? Preacher, is that why we don't have stadium seating in the sanctuary? The church does not exist for fun. The church does not exist for entertainment. The church exists to train men and women on how to grow up so that they can reach the goal of eternal life. Amen. Now, is it okay to have fun? Sure it is. But when we spend more time and money concerned about activity than we spend time and money <laughs> studying the scriptures, then we are off kilter. It's our responsibility as Pines Christian Church to do all that we can to help you grow up. Now, growing up, it's your responsibility. But we're supposed to be here to help you do that. Hebrews chapter 5.
preacher of Hebrews is talking about spiritual immaturity. <laughs> Have you ever noticed there are certain things that are constantly coming up in the Bible? I mean, it doesn't matter what book you study, that some way, somehow, there are just certain things that keep coming up over and over and over again. Do you ever wonder why that is? Is it perhaps because that's a reoccurring problem? And that the reoccurring problem continues to exist because humanity is so hard-headed and stubborn? Perhaps. Verse 11, Hebrews 5. We have a great deal to say about this, and it's difficult to explain since you have become too lazy to understand. We're not talking about mental capacity. We're talking about an act of a will. The preacher of Hebrews says, I've got a lot more I would like to preach about, but I can't because you chose not even to accept the elementary thing. You're not willing to do the work that is necessary to move from immaturity to maturity. Verse 12, although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. You need milk, not solid food. Now everyone who lives on milk Baptism and the Lord's Supper is inexperienced with the message about righteousness because he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature. For those whose senses, their attitudes and their actions have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. <laughs> James 2. Not many should become teachers, and I would suggest even more so preachers. My brothers, knowing that we will receive a stricter judgment, for we all stumble in many ways. That's true and faithful statement. We all still have a sin problem. We all still stumble. Listen to what he says here. This goes right along with what Paul is telling us. The preacher of Hebrews is telling us. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a mature man who is also able to control his own body. So basically what James is telling us is we can't control our tongue we can't control anything else in our life. And that's why it's always better to be seen than to be <coughs> You raising your hand back there? into our, our modern context. Okay. 
if I don't, because if I don't have control over my mind or my tongue, that means I don't have control over my mind. Seriously, you need to understand. If my tongue is not controlled, my mind is not controlled, and I am ruled, I am owned by my emotions. would all serve ourselves very well to control our tongues. But we cannot control our tongues until we take control of our minds and we cannot take control of our minds until we submit to God and His Word in all things. There are too many people who are trying to fight a battle that they will not win because they're not properly equipped. And when you're not properly equipped, not only are you not solving your own problem, you are adding to the problem of others. It is better to be seen than heard. Listen to what the Word of God says. We have got to get harness on our tongues. But in order to harness our tongues, our minds must be well fed and under control. Now, let's talk about another problem that we have to deal with in the church. That is a proper identification of what it means to be spiritual. If I ask you, how would you define what being a spiritual person is? What would come into your mind? What would you instantly start thinking about? Well, for too many today, the thought immediately rushes to some kind of an emotional response. And the illustration that I like to give of this is an illustration that, that actually happened to me. Ken. It was all based upon music. You ever heard of a congregation having an issue over the music? Well, this lady, who was just a tad bit older than me, and I was still, still alive, she's still older than me. <laughs> but, uh, her and I had a conversation one day. She was, she was part of the worship team. made the statement to me that she and those who were like-minded with her who wanted all the upbeat praise the worship songs to be used in the church that she and her people were more spiritual than the people who liked to sing the old hymns. But that is the kind of thinking that 
Wall Street life. That being spiritual is an emotional thing. That it's an emotional connection. Now, where does that thinking come from? It comes from false doctrine. It's another one of those examples where the modern, and I still consider this a counterfeit church, it's where the, the modern counterfeit church has once again gone out into the world, looked at pop culture, to see what the people are wanting in that day and time, and then incorporating that into their meetings. Is that the biblical definition of a spiritual person? Is a spiritual person someone who is with God. Oh, I just feel God today. Oh, this is such a spiritual experience. I just feel God all over me. That was my opinion, not what a spiritual person looks like. First, go back to 1 Corinthians 3. What's the classification here? Classification between those who are spiritual and fleshly. Those who are people who are pursuing godliness versus those people who are pursuing similarity with the world. Paul says, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh. So being considered a spiritual person is one who is like-minded with the scripture. It has nothing to do with any type of emotional connection. It has nothing to do with any event that is taking place. Being considered a spiritual person is one who has a well-educated, well-trained mind who is in the daily habit of practicing spiritual discipline, using spiritual discernment to make life choices day in and day out that are pleasing to God and make the world mad. That is a spiritual person. Chapter 6, Galatians. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brothers, if someone is caught in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual should restore such a person with a gentle spirit, watching out for yourself, so you also won't be tempted. So is Paul telling the church, go get all of your emotionally wrecked people and bring them in and let them educate the one who is in sin? Or is Paul telling the congregation, you find your spiritually mature people, and you put them in a spot to help this one who is not spiritually mature. <laughs> Would you want a three year old to do your brain surgery? Would you want an infant to do open heart surgery on you? Then why in the world do we continue to seek out 
the spiritually immature to help others, teach others, and train them. Letter C. Like-mindedness is based upon a standard. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse number one, Second Timothy chapter two. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men. Who will be able to teach others also? How can we teach other men if these other men cannot be found? That's one of the big problems that we have in the church today. There are not faithful men who are who are able and willing to be taught the scripture. They want to go off half cock doing their own thing rather than listening to the scriptures. Verse 3. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in the concerns of civilian life. He seeks to please the recruiter. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The rules means there's a standard. Now, Brother Mike, you are an, an official at sporting events, correct? <coughs> What happens if the competitor does something against the rule? Is he or she deemed the winner? No. What are they classified as? Disqualified. Disqualified. Is the pursuit of the things of this world? Is the desire to be accepted by your peers in the world? Are you so consumed with what the world says is valuable and important? and acceptable are all of those things so important to you that you are willing to be disqualified from eternal life there's a standard and you and I don't set the standard God has set the standard We have to know this. And we have to know it well enough to have an intelligent conversation with somebody else. Because everything that we learn here is valuable to us, but it's also valuable to everybody else that we care about. <clears throat> People need to hear this. They desperately need to hear this. For those of you who have been in the church.
worship as long as I am. You know full well what's going on. You know. You see. You've witnessed it. You've seen it. You've seen the absolute deterioration that's taking place in the church. You know it. You witnessed it. And there's a reason why. And this is one of the biggest reasons why. For too long, the church has tried to look like the world. We have looked at the world and we have said what attracts the world. And we have fallen all over ourselves to try to make ourselves look like the world. And we're paying the price for it. Our young people are paying the price for it. Ever since the time of Abraham, and that's been a day or two. Remember those days, Tom? <laughs> no, I'm younger than you. Two years now. since the time of Abraham, God has always expected his people to be different than the rest of the world. Good thing is it's not too late. The good thing is you and I here at Pines still have the opportunity to make a difference. But that's our choice, isn't it? We can hear the word. We can use the word. And we can make good decisions that honor and glorify God. We can continue to do the work of training our minds so that we can use the sermon. So that we can be a light into the darkness. Darkness does not dispel darkness, does it? And what is darkness? You see, darkness doesn't really exist. Just like cold doesn't exist. Darkness is the absence of light. Just as cold is an absence of heat. And Brother Dean and I really like the absence of heat, don't we? <laughs> I think Rosalind's the same way. Yeah. There's a few of us that don't care for Do you understand what I'm saying, church? And see what, what makes all this even worse is how people have misused and abused these two verses that we're studying today. Because they'll go to these two verses and say, well, look, Paul said it's okay as long as I do what I believe to be right. That's not what Paul said. Paul never said that. But because preachers aren't preaching the word, because people in the congregation do not have a hunger and thirst for, for the knowledge of the scripture, this is what happens and this is why it happens. Are the things of this world, more so than anything else today, is acceptance in this world worth being disqualified? Comes to eternal life. Church, the pressure is on. It's on in a way that's never been on in 
my lifetime. But I've watched the heat being turned up. You watch the old thing about the frog in the water. In the water. Put him in the cold water, turn the heat on, you'll boil him to death because he just kind of adapts to the temperature. We've adapted for way too long. It's, it's happening in the restoration movement. And that's the saddest part of all. That's the saddest part of all. There was a day and time in the world we define a restoration movement church as a church that operated solely upon the scriptures and its membership, not just the preaching, its membership was wholly dedicated study of the scriptures and the scriptures alone. There's a newspaper article that came out of one of the big New York Times or press newspapers back in the late 1800s. And that's exactly how the world looked at us, saw us, and described us as the Christian Church, Church of Christ. Those people were different than all the other denominations. And what made them different is, is that their people, from top to bottom, young to old, were biblically sound. They were biblically knowledgeable people. And when they spoke about anything, they spoke about things based upon their knowledge of the Scripture. That's how we used to appear to the world. How do we appear to the world today? Is that what the New York Times would print today about the Restoration Movement? About the Churches of Christ and Christian churches who claim to be people of still the people of the bone. Let's go. I'll save my pondering for next week. say, preacher, you're awful harsh on the restoration movement. Do you really think you ought to be harsh on, on our brothers and sisters? Yes. If you don't think that's the case, go, go, go home and read Galatians this afternoon. Have you heard of a guy called Peter? Was he an apostle? Okay. You heard of a guy called Paul. Well, he was he an apostle? Yeah. Well, guess what? <laughs> Peter got off track. Peter was wrong. Peter was trying to please the world. He wanted to fit in with the rest of the people. And Paul says, I went and I got in his face. And I showed him where he was wrong and told him he needed to change the way he acts. If you love the restoration of 
that's your choice. And you need to be concerned as well. You need to be concerned as well. All you have to do is read the book. See what happens when God's people become unfaithful to Him. Everything unravels. And there are too many lives today that are unraveling because lives are not being lived on the basis of the Scriptures. And that's the message that needs to be preached. We need to be countercultural, not seeking to be like them. All right. Got enough to think about this week? If not, come see me. Let's stand and sing our hymn meditation. Wonderful is my redeemer. Tonight we're going to start a new study, so if you would like to have one of the outlines for that study, bring a good-sized three-ring binder. This outline is 150 pages, so if you would like to have one of the outlines, we'll be distributing them this evening, so bring a three-ring binder. If any of you would like to have that emailed to you so that you can put it on one of your devices, let me know and we can do that as well. Some of you like to use your tablets. So if you would like to have that in that format, then give me your email before you leave today. Okay. There's something else I was going to set up while you were sleeping. Goodbye, I'm done. I'll do something else. But that's all right. All right. All the God's people said? Amen. All right. Stay standing. All we got to announce is for tonight is connection and evening service. Let's see. Anything else?
Dearly Father, we appreciate this time together this morning, and we appreciate what we can learn from your word. We also pray that now that you go with us, help us through the world as we encounter those that are against you, and we just pray that we can always be a beacon for you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>